So let's get into a book called The Gambler by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This book is not one of his longer ones. I talked about before, Russian novels tend to be these huge tomes. This book is more the length of an average novel that we would expect today. Maybe a little bit longer. But when you compare this to other books by the same author, Brothers Karamazov and Crime and Punishment, are absolutely huge. I think they're longer than Moby Dick. They are comparable to Anna Karenina by Tolstoy and War and Peace by Tolstoy. I don't believe they're quite as long as Water Margin and Romance of the Three Kingdoms from China. But still, these are some big books, nothing to balk at. But then The Gambler is shorter than those other ones, and there's a reason for that. You see, would you ever have guessed that the author of a book called The Gambler, about a man who's addicted to roulette, would you ever have guessed that that author himself had a gambling addiction? Wow, surprise, surprise. Well, he did, and it was during one of his times of financial straits that he had a year to write a book called The Gambler, or else he would give up all his literary publishing rights to that publishing house that he made the deal with. So he started out with a whole year, and what do you think happened? He puts it off, he puts it off, and all of a sudden there's just a couple months left, and he's been spending the whole rest of the year working on crime and punishment, not the gambler. He has to get this book done, and what does he do? Something interesting. He goes out and he finds a stenographer, someone who's trained in writing shorthand, someone who can write as fast as they can listen to somebody talk. There were only like a handful of these people in writing. Russia at the time and all of Russia. He went out and he found someone who teaches this stuff and he got one of that person's students. If I'm not mistaken, that stenographer he hired, it, it might have been this one or it might have been a future stenographer that he would hire to work on one of his future books, but one of the stenographers he hired went on to become his wife. But he has one or two months to finish this book and he does it by speaking out loud while the stenographer writes down everything he says in shorthand and then later on they go back and they translate the shorthand, transcribe the shorthand into written words that everyone can read. And that's how they submit that manuscript. Perhaps because they did it in such a rushed way, I find that there's a lot less of the characters talking and talking and talking around every single one of the plot points. In Brothers Karamazov, you get one plot point and then you get pages upon pages upon pages of the characters talking philosophy with each other. In Crime and Punishment, it's a similar thing. But then this one feels less like Dostoevsky in that way, maybe because he was rushed. You get some of that philosophy in the beginning where the protagonist is sort of speaking in justification for the act of gambling. But then I think quickly Dostoevsky realized he had a time crunch, he couldn't waste too much time on that, he needed to at least get the plot written down. And also because of that, I think the main point of this book, the point that he was trying to get across, is a lot less explicit, a lot less in your face than it is with his other books. You sort of have to read between the lines and infer the main point that he's trying at. So what is the plot of this book? There is a man who's addicted to gambling, he works as the tutor for a Russian general, or rather the family of the Russian general. He is a tutor to the general's daughter, a young woman named Polina, a young woman who the protagonist is deeply in love with, but this young woman could not care less at all about him. She knows, he knows she knows, they both know each other know, they talk about it, and they have a really weird relationship as a result of that. Meanwhile, there's a Frenchman involved that we later find out the general is in debt to. There's an Englishman involved who becomes a friend slash acquaintance of the protagonist. And then there's the general's aunt, who is an old lady, she lives all the way back in Russia. These characters are currently staying in one of the European cities, a fictional town called Roulettenburg. Ha ha, Roulettenburg. Ha ha ha, funny joke. But supposedly this old lady is very sick, and so the general is constantly writing letters back and forth to Russia asking about her health. Also, there's another woman involved, a woman named Blanche, who is this sort of high society, mysterious European character who's supposedly involved with the general. Now, most of the main plot action happens when the general's aunt, this old lady that's supposed to be sick, actually comes in person and shows up to Roulettenburg to say, Haha, see, I'm completely fine. Oh, and I know what you were trying to do asking about my health. You're waiting for me to die because you want my money. You want to inherit my wealth. Sort of verbal slaps to the face when she comes down, and then she asks the protagonist to show her around town specifically to the casino 
where she proceeds to spend a lot of money playing roulette and then a lot more money. She wins some, she loses some, she gets addicted when she wins some, she can't step away, and she ends up blowing huge amounts of her money on this roulette wheel over the course of a few days. And all the other characters are just sort of watching on in horror as she gets cheated and gambles away all her money. And then finally she goes back to Russia with the little that she has left, and she pledges to use that little bit of money she has left to build a church back in her hometown that she promised somebody she would do. But then towards the end of the book, something interesting happens. Initially, towards the beginning, Polina asked, the protagonist's name is Alexei, Polina asked Alexei to gamble on her behalf and win some money. She did not tell him why, but we later learn why is because of the general's debt. Polina wants to try and pay that off. That is the general's debt to the Frenchman. Towards the end of the book, after the grandmother leaves, we see Alexei have an unprecedented, unthinkable streak of luck when thousands and thousands and thousands of currency. He brings it back to Polina, and Polina, in a little bit of a surprising turn, she throws that money back in his face. She doesn't want it. She feels like she's being bought off. She feels like her love is being purchased. So, Alexei, what does he do after this? Well, the only sensible thing he runs off with, wait for it, drumroll, Blanche. The gold-digging woman that was interested in the general because she thought the general would inherit the old lady's money. Well, the general doesn't have that money anymore, and Alexei suddenly has a lot of money. They run away to Paris, they get married, Blanche spends all Alexei's money, and Alexei ends up poor, once again wandering the streets of Europe, where he, by chance, runs into his old friend, the Englishman, who is a frequent character in this book. The Englishman tells him that Polina has since gone off to a relative in Sweden. Alexei can go to her if he wants. Wants, but instead of doing that, he ends up gambling. He absolutely cannot stop himself from gambling, and that's a common theme in this book. This book explores the addictive side of gambling. The protagonist, Alexei, suffers from this horrible compulsion to gamble. He could not stop even if he wanted to. And throughout the book, we see other characters recognizing that he has a serious problem. He cannot keep himself away from the gambling table. In the very beginning, the general mentions something about it to his face, tells him to keep Polina away from the casino, says that he's going to hold some of his money safely so he won't spend it on gambling, and even in that very last scene at the end when he's meeting the Englishman for the last time, the Englishman said, oh, you're such a good friend, I would loan you this large amount of money if I could, or rather I would give it as a gift. However, I know that you're so addicted to gambling that giving you a large amount of money or a small amount of money, it makes absolutely no difference. You will lose the money in the same amount of time, so I will give you this small amount of money because I know that you're going to go and spend it on gambling. But for all the trouble that he himself has with gambling, he still tries to warn some of the other characters away from it. He expresses sympathy for characters that lose a lot of their savings in gambling, and he does his best to advise the the old lady not to gamble, or at least to gamble in a more sensible way. So there's a little bit of do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do attitude about it. And like I said, in the very beginning, there are some philosophical thoughts expressed by this main character before Dostoevsky realized he needed to hurry along with this novel and cut out a lot of that underlying philosophy. The character, just thinking to himself, tries to justify the act of gambling, saying, how is it any worse than being a merchant? True, for every winner at the gambling table, there are ten losers, but what business is that of yours or even of mine? He chooses to gamble, and so be it. In fact, in that way, that brief piece of philosophy at the beginning where he's justifying gambling to himself, it feels a little bit like reading another book that I've read before called Moby Dick. It feels like listening to those characters' inner thoughts, thinking about all the historical references to whaling, to their industry, all the biblical references to whales, leviathans. These characters bring up those examples. They know the history, they know the underlying philosophy of their profession. And the attitude that that is expressed in Moby Dick feels very similar to the attitude that Alexei takes when he's talking, or rather thinking to himself, about gambling in the beginning of this book. Another theme that I think was at least in the back of the author's head when he was writing this book was moral and financial corruption. We see this environment and this cast of characters where so many people are in debt to one another, or they have contentious relationships with one another, they're keeping secrets from each other. And I think there's a point about, what what's the word for it, should I call it honesty or straight-handedness, that the author is trying to get across, maybe. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, it's hard to tell. But one other reason I think this may be the case is a sort of tangent, a rant that the main character goes off in. Again, closer to the beginning of the book, he compares the Russian way of acquiring wealth, which is gambling, with the German way of acquiring wealth, which is 
a lifetime of multi-generational hard work and building up those savings to pass this huge savings down to the next generation. So the main character, when he's talking about this, he identifies that multi-generational saving method as the German way of acquiring wealth, as opposed to Russians risking it all for a chance at striking it rich without doing any real work. But then the problem with the Russian way, of course, we saw, is even when Alexei strikes it big, he doesn't know how to maintain that wealth. He doesn't know how to keep himself off the street after he gets that wealth. Mary is a woman who spends all his money, and then soon after, he's back on the street. But that whole spiel he had about the German way to acquire wealth reminded me a lot of Way to Wealth by Benjamin Franklin. Ben Franklin, of course, writing that under the pen name of Poor Richard from Poor Richard's Almanac. Describing the virtues of frugality and hard work, it feels like a very German. Of course, Franklin was born in New England, but later came to Philadelphia early in his life. Philadelphia being a place with a lot of Quakers, but rural Pennsylvania being a place with a lot, a lot of German Protestants. Not just any German Protestants, but the radical reformers of the Protestant Reformation. Yes, Lutherans, but also Anabaptists and all that. And the way to wealth when Ben Franklin wrote it was, I think, influenced by his environment at the time, being surrounded by so many people with that German honest work ethic. This strong sense for honest versus dishonorable work, I think is the perfect example of what Dostoevsky is trying to get at when he describes the German way of acquiring wealth. Now, I want to hone in next a little bit on the protagonist relationship with this woman, Polina. They are both very familiar with the fact that he's in love with her, but she couldn't care less about him. He told her once that he would jump from the Schlangenberg, which means he would jump from a very high place and plummet to his death if she told him to. And there's a scene in the early parts of the book before the old lady arrives where Polina tells him, okay, I don't want you to jump and kill yourself, but I do want you to humiliate yourself for my entertainment. I want you to go over there to that German aristocrat and insult him for me. So he does. He, he resigns himself. He needs no encouragement to do that. And he even does it at the peril of his job because there's a whole drama about the general getting a complaint from this German aristocrat and briefly firing Alexei, but then rehiring him after Alexei threatens to go and start a duel with this German. But that's just one illustration of the lengths he would go to to do what Polina tells him to, even though he knows she doesn't care about him. But at the same time he knows he's being used, there's a scene where he tells her that he would stab her with a knife if he could. And I found a pretty beautiful quote in here about the way that she regards him, quote, The empress who hesitated not to disrobe herself in the presence of a slave because she did not consider a slave a man, end quote. Of course, comparing Polina to this empress. I forget which one of the empresses of Russia. Now, in light of this dedication to her in the beginning parts of the book, the reader might think that it's strange that he doesn't pursue her further when he finds out she's living in Sweden. I did find an explanation for this because I did something that I don't usually do for these book reviews. I looked at a few other reviews that people have done on this book. I found one by the Literary Nomad. I will link that in the description. His theory was that his love for Polina has nothing to do with Polina herself. It's rather a way to satiate his own feelings and desires. It could be considered a symptom of his addictive personality. He could satiate it with gambling, he could satiate it with Blanche or Polina, and I thought that was interesting to say the least. But more on me watching other book reviews for this before getting into my own. I did feel, I don't know how to describe it, sort of a challenge to do this particular book review because I read the book, I don't review every single book that I read, but I wanted to review this one, and I couldn't quite place my finger on why. But then because I mentioned in the beginning Dostoevsky wrote this one fast, he didn't put it, he didn't put the main point in your face that it was easy to extract, I had to spend a lot of time thinking and getting my thoughts together in order to really figure out what I was going to say in this review. Usually I will get all my notes together, and either before or after recording, but certainly after I get my notes together, that's when I'll watch the other reviews. But in this one, I actually sort of did copy some of their points. The one that I copied from most Literary Nomad, I did link his channel in the description, so apologies and also thank you for helping me get my thoughts together for this one. I certainly consider it bad form for myself to have done that. But like I said, this I, I wanted to get a review of this book. I wanted to get thoughts down about this.
this book. Another thing that Literary Nomad brought up is people who have been close to addiction get more meaning from this book than they do from Crime and Punishment. I am not as close to addiction as I could be. I think I did get more meaning from Crime and Punishment, but that could also be because I'm such a big fan of Solzhenitsyn. The way that guilt is illustrated in Crime and Punishment resonated with me. This concept of guilt so strong that somebody, even if they could completely get away with crime and they knew it, the guilt would drive them to want punishment, to seek out that punishment and justice for themselves. I think that main point of Crime and Punishment resonates more with me than this Gambler book. But as long as I am on the topic of addiction, I'll bring up something that I brought up before in the Mark Collette Fall of Western Man book review, that is, putting addiction in spiritual terms, like I always say, it's only a matter of time before I get into religion during one of these book reviews, but putting it in spiritual terms, I like to think of it as every action, every second of every day is an act of worship to either the one true God or to some other God, some idol somewhere. Every action is a means to serve some goal or some God. So many of the main characters' actions in this book are in service to the God of Gambling, that false idol of Gambling. And in fact, the grip that this false idol has on him is so strong that he cannot resist the urge to do it. It has a strong enough hold on him that it is stealing his willpower, sapping his willpower, and he does it even if he doesn't want to, he does it even if he tries not to, he does it even if it hurts him, he does it even if it brings him completely financially to his knees and ruins his reputation. He does it even when he has the option at the very end to go and pursue the woman who he claims that he loves. And in that way, it is an illness. It is the loss of control when you can control other aspects of your life, but you can't control this urge. You can't control the way that you react to this urge. And that's the powerful nature of addiction and gambling that the author, I think, did get across pretty well in this book.